name is Jeremy, and I'm here today to talk to you about infrastructure data. So what is infrastructure data? That is basically the data that is generated by your infrastructure. Uh, as you automate your infrastructure, the speed of this generation increases. And I want to talk to you about it because I want to talk to you about how you can use it to increase your resilience, scalability, efficiency, and velocity when you analyze it correctly. So really, this whole talk is about finding the right data and presenting it the right way so you can do useful things with it, build better systems. So for those of you who remember your physics class, you'll remember that uh, a, you know, a vehicle moving down the street the, is going over a certain distance, and the first derivative of that is the speed, and the next derivative of that is the acceleration. And so I'm here today to talk to you about derivative data, which is sort of similar. So if you look at this Google map, for example, the data is the map. It's where the roads, the buildings are, et cetera. And then there's some metadata. There's this, uh, this here, and there's some other stuff here about tourism and coffee shops and all of that. And what's interesting is when Google puts all of this metadata together, they actually are creating a second derivative metadata. So uh, if you can see, there's orange sections in Google Maps. And those orange sections represent areas where Google says that this is a lot of commercial activity, it's a place that you can hang out at night, whatever. And all of that is data that they derived from their metadata. And that's kind of the concept that I want to get today, is, is that you ha probably have a lot of metadata about your infrastructure, and when you derive data from it, you can get interesting insights. So you heard about infrastructure as code earlier. Uh, one of the best ways to leverage a lot of this data is to use the infrastructure as code principles, uh, you know, where your uh, changes are routine and small, and your, everything is small and disposable, and servers come up and come down in an automated way. Basically, what I'm trying to say is the more automation you have, the more useful your infrastructure metadata is going to be, because you will be able to do automated things to it, and you expect regularity out of it. So if you're uh, automating your deployments and you're aug automating uh, you know, your configurations on all of that, then everything should be uniform and regular, and so you can look for deviations. Uh, for example, at my company, we use CloudFormation for everything. So this is just a small selection of our cloud formations. Uh, and uh, you know, looking at this one, for example, uh, there's a cloud formation literally just to create a role, and then another cloud formation to literally just spread that role around to other parts of the infrastructure. So we use automation for everything, even the smallest tasks. We try not to do anything manually so that we can take advantage of these things. Uh, and when I was here a few years ago, I talked about the proper microservices architecture. Uh, and so today, I want to use that same framework to talk about various things that you can use your metadata for. Uh, so let's look at a simple example. Right? We have this uh, where you can select uh, using OS Query, and you can say, what's the version of Apache on this machine? Then you can take that and you can do interesting stuff. So you can combine it with your uh, metadata from your cloud. So you can say, what are the Apache versions running on all of the different instances across my cloud? Uh, and this can help you with your continuous deployment, because now you can say, you know, certain things are out of date, so the deployment isn't working, it's not doing what's expected, because if your entire deployment is automated, you would expect that everything is running the same version of Apache, as an example. Or maybe it's not, and it is doing exactly what you want. But using automated infrastructure plus some combining different sources of metadata, so there's the sources on the instance and the sources from Amazon's API in this case, uh, you can get new insights about whether things are working or not. Uh, talking about uh, monitoring and alerting, so these are some very old graphs from uh, some, a Reddit outage. And you can look at these graphs, and they tell you, you know, the graph is itself is metadata, and it tells you about the infrastructure, it tells you about the network, and the uh, cluster status, HTTP status, and you know, these are interesting. And if you add a bunch of more graphs to it, then you can start to see a picture of what went wrong, right? There's, there's the, the memory problem and the heat problem, and so you can start to see correlations between the graphs. But what's really interesting is the correlations, because the correlations are what are going to get you to the problem. Uh, it's funny, because earlier was that quote about, uh, you know, by going to microservices, now everything is a murder mystery. 
which is totally true. And using stuff like this, you can get to the problem faster using the correlations. Uh, so that's why Netflix built Atlas, which has been open source for a while now. Uh, one of the nice things about it, and an example here, is that you can graph those correlations. You don't have to visually look at a bunch of different graphs. You can just tell the graph, take all these different sources of data, put them together, run some math on it, and that's what those green bars are. That represents essentially the difference between, in this case, predicted and actual. And so you can then set your alerts on those particular green bars. Uh, you can also tune your alerts uh, using uh, the same data. So you can use that correlated data to tune your alerts. This is an example where uh, you can essentially set the width of the bands depending on the time of day so that you can have good alerts at different times. And so how do you choose what metrics to look at? Uh, well, the first thing is self-serve is key. Right? This is an important principle uh, at Netflix, and it's one that I think is really critical everywhere. The developers who are developing the system are the ones who know best what that system should be doing, uh, what metrics are important to the health of that system. And so letting, creating a system where developers can choose the metrics is, is super essential, where they can choose the graphs that show up on the dashboards, when they can choose the alerts for themselves, uh, so this system just works much better this way. And then you get the best insights because the developers themselves are telling you what to do. Uh, one other important tip is, especially in a distributed scalable system, you definitely want to alert on uh, la uh, increases of failure instead of lack of success. Uh, there's a lot of ways that lack of success could happen that aren't bad, uh, like you're shifting traffic from one service to another, uh, or you're bringing down one cluster and bringing up another, but your failures should not increase unless you've done something bad. Uh, and then another important thing about picking a metric is, is which metrics you want, right? So P50, 90, 99, this represents percentiles, 50th, 90th, 99th. Uh, and you can get very different pictures depending on which one you choose. Uh, so this is a graph of uh, request latencies over time. And if you look at the bottom line, that's the 50th percentile, which means effectively half the people are seeing below that and half are seeing above it. And that tells you the service is doing well. And if you move up to the 90 line, it's telling you that you know, almost everybody is getting a good experience. But if you go up to the 99, you can see things are getting a lot dicier. So it depends what you're aiming for. Do you want 90% of the people to have a great experience with some outliers? Or are you more, do, you, do you want to optimize around everybody having a better experience? So are you going to be looking at that 99th percentile or the 90th? Uh, going to some network and traffic. So I just want to pull this up in the network section real quick. So this is an on-instance uh, data that tells you about uh, which ports are listening. So just remember that one for later when we get to the security section. And so this is a video of uh, a system that was developed at Netflix that helps uh, shows how traffic works. And you can see here that this is the example of an outage where error rates are starting to get high in that upper left region. And so the traffic starts getting shifted to another region. And it's sending it over to the other region where error rates are low. So the overall system error rates now you can see are starting to fall because all the traffic is succeeding. And so this is, all, this is essentially a visualization of traffic metadata. Where is the traffic flowing? Is it being successful? Things like that. And then in a second, you'll see that the error rates are lower over on that broken region. So now it'll start sending the traffic back, and everything will be happy. And so this visualization is a, is a good example of taking network data and visualizing it in a way that's useful, that tells you immediately what's going on, what's happening. You can glance right at this graph and see, oh, there's an, a problem in that region. You, you can just look at the thickness of the bars. Uh, another quick visualization I want to talk about is, uh, so the last time I was here, I talked about uh, rendezvous hashing or highest random weight. Uh, this formula, just keep it in mind. But it's not that important. What's important to know is that when you're trying to access your cache, you take an item, and you, every individual instance calculates all of these numbers for each cache. Uh, and then it picks the one that has the highest number. And that is how it chooses which cache to go to. And so this is a nice way for all of them to con converge on you know, this chunk of data goes to this cache machine. Uh, but it's independent, so it requires no coordination. 
But what I've discovered is that if you log every one of those individual weights that's chosen, you can get a nice graph of how well your cache is doing. So uh, this fractal layout, which is best illustrated by this XKCD comic, uh, what you do is you take all of the hash numbers and you lay them out next to each other in that fractal pattern, uh, and then you log when every single number that you get in that calculation. And you just put it into like a log that shoots the logs over every minute or something, fire and forget, if you lose some, it doesn't matter. And if everything is working well, then you get a nice graph that looks like this. It looks like random noise, basically, because that's what it should look like. If it's randomizing the data across the caches properly, it'll be nice random noise. But if you have a problem, you'll see something that looks like this, where there's hot spots. In this case, white means more access. Uh, so you'll see hot spots, caches that are getting hit too often. And so now you can dive in and you can say, is this because a particular uh, item is too hot, or is it because there's a, a mismatch? Uh, do some machines not have network access to certain caches, so they're ignoring it and sending to a different cache? Uh, things like that. And so this kind of visualization uh, is really all about the, the data that you're getting about these cache keys. That the, the random weights themselves are meaningless uh, in isolation, but you put them together and you get a graph like this. This is useful. Uh, other ways that you can get useful data is by uh, taking cost data from Amazon and combining it with Amazon API data. So you put them into the same database and you can immediately see what your most costly instances are. Uh, and then you go one derivative higher and you look at your tags. Uh, and if you're using a good automated deployment system, then of course all of your tags are perfect with no noise at all. That was a joke. Uh, and uh, you can then roll up into uh, the, this graph of our most expensive clusters based on the tags. So this is an important uh, point to make about having clean data and having good tagging and using automated systems again because it will get you this data that you can get to. Uh, another way of using this sort of higher level data, this is automated canary analysis from uh, Armory Spinnaker uh, where you can see this graph here of uh, they, there is a new cluster and a existing cluster, and so you start both graphs at the same time, and you can immediately see, just using the memory and CPU, that something is wrong. This canary is not performing well because it is, using, it is spiking a lot as opposed to the baseline, which is not. Presumably, they're getting the same traffic, so something must be wrong with that canary. Uh, using your automated systems, you could look at this and immediately roll that canary back without ever having to have a human touch anything or look at anything. All of this basically from the derived data. Uh, another place where derived data is super useful is in the security zone area. Uh, you can, so remember that data from before about ports that are listening. You start combining that with uh, some Amazon data, and you can say, OK, what are all of the uh, machines that are listening on port 443 in a group that's open on 443? You can go further down and say, OK, how many of those are running Apache? You can go even further down and say how many of those are running Apache and are in a group that is open to the internet on 443, and now you can target your deployment of patches, because you can say, OK, are those running the right version of Apache that's the most secure, or do we need to do a SWAT team and get that out you know, fixed real fast? So this derived data using multiple sources into a single, uh, single repository of data that you can query is extremely powerful. Uh, and so that's some stuff within the uh, microservices framework. Uh, now I want to preach to you the gospel of queues. Uh, queues are a great uh, way to get insight into your data, or to your systems, I mean. Uh, they produce a lot of data that is metadata that's extremely useful. Uh, pretty much anything you're writing to a data store, you want to put in a queue, anything that's going from one system to another. Because uh, then you can get useful insights like this, right? You can see the queue depth. You can see that at around second 8, 9, 10, something went wrong, which is where I want to uh, remind you about cumulative flow diagrams, uh, which I've talked about in the past. Uh, when you have, so a cumulative flow diagram is a diagram that's basically just a running total. It's always moving up and to the right. Uh, but what's interesting is now you can look at this graph and you can see immediately that the problem here uh, was that things were not leaving the queue fast enough. In other words, they weren't being processed fast enough. 
Uh, so this is useful information. Now you don't have to worry about were we generating data too quickly. You can immediately focus on why were we not processing the data quickly enough. Also, knowing your capacity, uh, your utilization causes uh, queues to in increase queues exponentially. Uh, so you can keep that in mind. If you're looking at your queues and they're super flat, then you know that you can reduce your resources uh, c as long as that exponential curve is going to be a problem. Uh, if you're seeing an exponential curve, you know that you need to add more resources. Uh, and then there's the price of variability on a queue. So knowing having your queues makes it easier to see that price of variability. Uh, this is an example of something that we actually did at Reddit, where on one side is the example of a single queue for all requests. So we were actually running HAProxy, uh, and at first we were just taking every request that came in and putting it, you know, let, let the proxy just spread it around. But what would happen is you would get a bunch of slow requests in a row that would take up all the servers and slow everything down. So then we started sort of randomly distributing it across uh, all the different servers, so there would be different queues for each one. But still, you, would have, you could get at a point where there was a slow request at the front of every queue. And so what we ended up doing was using a bunch of metadata that we had about request speeds to determine these APIs tended to be fast, these tended to be slow, and we would reconfigure the load balancer so that this cluster only got fast requests, this one only got slow requests, and so all the slow requests would line up onto one set of servers that were just for serving slow requests, and the other requests would go to the fast servers so that the user never experienced a slowdown in what should be a quick request because they were never waiting behind a slow one. So all of this data we were able to get because we had these queues that were telling us who's waiting, why are they waiting, slowness, things like that. Uh, so hopefully I have convinced you of the gospel of queues and why everything you do should be in a queue. Uh, even things that don't seem like they should be in a queue or it's not super useful, if you put them in, you get a bunch of extra insight, which is really nice. So uh, you know, consider queues. So at the beginning, we talked about infrastructure as code. Uh, we talked about some uh, I, ways to use uh, that to help yourself. Uh, so let's talk about, real quick, some of the problems with infrastructure as code, the challenges, right? You, losing track of servers. Well, if you're using all of that data, putting it together, you won't lose track of servers. Configuration drift, we talked about how to avoid that. Uh, snowflakes, servers that are unique because you're logging in by hand. If you're not logging into a machine by hand ever, then you don't have to worry about that. Uh, if you don't have SSH on the box, even better still. Uh, the last thing is the fear of a fully automated system. A lot of people, even if they've got everything automated, they're afraid to use the automation uh, because they're afraid that something might break. And so with better data, better insight, better meta insight, you'll feel more confident in using fully automated systems when you know that you will be immediately able to see any problems that exist. So at first I said we want to find the right data. Now I'm saying we want to find the right second order data because that is really where your best insights are going to come from, that derivative data from the metadata. And that's it for me. So if you have any questions, that's how you can find me. Thank you very much.